Regular, co- regular contributor to the show, Joel Jamal. How pleasure, you doing, Joel? Pleasure to be here. Token Arab. Token, we're getting the ethnic, the ethnic quota is up. We can't be, we can't be racist because no. we have Joel on the show. Now we just need yeah, Dukes well, to identify I'm, I'm as friends. a girl, and we're right. No, I'm, I'm already impressed. I'm a ginger. <laughs> uh, Senator Keneally's path to the front bench became possible when New South Wales MP Ed Husick, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, H-U-S-I-C, relinquished his role. And Don Farrell opted against seeking re-election as deputy leader in the Senate. Um, and so that means Chris Dana was able to get it, right? So what this is a classic case of is someone getting promoted because of their gender. And uh, I've got to make those quotas. Got to make those said. quotas. You've got to get that <laughs> representation. Exactly. That's mind. why I'm here. You've got, to, you've got to get the optics. That's right. Because you know what? <laughs> Having a gay Asian lady uh, as the front <laughs> is just not enough boxes ticked. Yeah. Having, having three men in the four leadership positions? Oh, my God. Oh my <laughs> what a tragedy. What a tragedy. And then you get um, the only qualification she has to, to be in there instead of this other bloke is her damn gender, right? Is her damn gender. It's like, can we get a grip? Yeah. Can we get a grip? It's terrible. And it sort of it reflects, like, even with workforce things, if a woman gets a job just because of her gender... Yeah. We will never know if she was actually the right fit sure. for that. And, and, and it casts a doubt on her. And it's like absolutely. she will never feel like that's something she yeah. can ever pay back. And through the ceiling, know. baby. They don't do it yourself. <laughs> it's what they do to the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you get any more ceilings, you just go straight through it again. <laughs> yeah. That's what, you know, what Labour Party's going with. Good luck to them. It might win them, might win them a few votes. Mm. Um, if it does, then power to them. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> We don't, well, I'm not really that familiar with the EU elections, but I'm going to give you my best, my best crack at it. I know Joel's probably got some information up there. Now, basically, in Europe, most countries are part of the EU. Not all of them, but most of them. Most of them. It's a lot like it's the, the, the European it? Union. It's not like the UN, right? except really for, like, Yeah, it's like the UN, just, except for, just, just for Europe. Europe. And it's full of globalists. Mm. It's, not, it's full of globalists. How can you be a globalist and, but um, specialise in the EU? Yeah. Well, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the European Union makes a lot of decisions on behalf of the member countries, uh, and often those member countries uh, don't actually get asked when those decisions are made on their behalf. Right. Yeah, that's right. And so the thing that really triggered a lot of uh, a lot of anger at the European Union was the immigration crisis in like mm. 2014, 15, yeah. when the people in Brussels, which is where the European Parliament is like distributed decided where all the immigrants were going to go across europe right and so a lot of countries had no say in their own immigration policies because they've given up their borders because that's one of the things about the eu as well if you're in the european union and you hold a a passport of any european country you can go you can go anywhere without like a visa or whatever and so then a bunch of countries were like well we can't have these uh elites 1.6 million syrian muslims that just arrived in germany yeah. coming to you know, yeah. the and UK for example and it's like well we kind of need to have a similar thing in Britain and what we had in Australia is like if we're going to be a country we actually need to be able to protect our own borders and decide who gets to come in yeah. um, people vote for the European Parliament representative in the same way they vote for their representative in the national parliament in the federal parliament right yep. so there are people representing individual districts which then go into Brussels and they have the parliament there which has got like 750 people together. Yeah, it's yeah. it's 7, 760 for the total and then it's 120 for um, I think just the UK. Right, yeah. so yeah. so what, what happens then is um, people once they get into that parliament form like cross-country groups, right? So you have like a centre-right group but it's not just a centre-right from a country, it's a centre-right from several countries together who form one group and they usually vote the same way on all the different issues. So the two the two main ones, uh, the centre-right one, the European People's Party, and the centre-left, Socialists and Democrats, uh, are set to remain the two largest blocks. However, they did both uh, together hold a majority, which they have now lost. Um, so you need about 375 seats in order to gain a majority and they have slipped to about 340 i think yeah so yeah. so marine had a good weekend beating out president macron's renaissance Le alliance Le macron. now macron's been having like riots in his country for like the past 20 weeks every single week and it's been like fire riots like flipping cars Pe- riots, people like, getting their eyes shot out right. oh, yeah. <laughs> some, some bad some 
oh yeah, some bad things going on in France. He's got an approval rating lower than like thirty percent, I think. He's um, going but they won't report on it because Macron is uh, he's a cut and dry globalist. My- the EU loves loves having women as as their front people until the women disagree with them, right? <laughs> Nobody gets smashed more than right wing women. Yeah. Like you look at Marie Le Pen, look at Candace Owens, look at Sarah Palin, um, look at um, look at uh, Peter Credlin. Mm. Um, nobody gets smashed more than right wing women. Yeah. Uh, or, or like right wing black people, mm. they get yeah. smashed. I've, I've... So the actual Brexit party got thirty five percent, right? They got thirty five percent of the of the primary vote, and the Liberal Democrats got twenty percent in second, who are the main uh, people who advocate remaining in the EU. Then on top of a few more minor parties, right, um, who say their support overall is about 40%, right? But for those of you who want to do the maths, uh, 40% plus 35% leaves room for another 25%. And that 25% of votes was actually taken up by uh, Jeremy Corbyn's Labor Party and the Tory uh, Conservative Party, right? Both of whom ran an election, a federal election campaign on promising to remove Brexit. They both said we, uh, the people have voted, we should not have another referendum. Now, since then, they've become a bit wobbly. Um, but the only votes they have are votes which are actually predicated on Brexit, right? And they promise that to the people. So for people to just disqualify uh, the two main parties as not being uh, pro-Brexit um, is, is wrong. But what that actually does implicitly, right, implicitly, is it actually affirms the notions that those two major parties, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party and uh, formerly Theresa May's Conservative Party, were actually working the whole time to undermine Brexit from the start, right? So when your whole spin on the election is to say, well, uh, the Labour Party and the Conservative Tory Party were actually never working for Brexit in the first place, you're actually totally validating the alt-right um, kind of conspiracy um, that the elites were trying to undermine the will of the people the whole time. And as far as I'm concerned, that's actually exactly what happened. And I hope that the new hard line for Brexit, which Nigel Farage said was at October 31st, where they're going to leave Brexit with or without a deal, mm. uh, or alternatively, if they get sabotaged by the establishment again, what mm. you're going to see is a massive turnout at the federal election. <laughs> you're going to see yeah. the punishment of all major parties, yeah. uh, and it's going to be ugly. Running in all 260 seats, I think he said. Yeah. I know, we'll Jeez. see how we go. And, and that's what he's saying. He's saying, look, this has been a big wake-up call for both you parties. You need to... You need to sort this out or else sure. I will well, I mean, be if that, like If those numbers of like 12% each of the major parties continue into the federal election, they are stuffed. For yeah. like 100 years of like, or however long it's been, of like Tory versus Labor. Yeah. Um, it's screwed. It's done. It's over. It's a new yeah. new, new age of politics. Well, there's definitely a bigger chance that Tory's um, going to go before, before yeah. Labor. Yeah. yeah. Well, Tories have no idea about the uh, who their leader's going to be. Because yeah. Boris is a known flipper. He's flipped back and forth on this a lot of times. Yeah. Boris famously wrote, well, had an article uh, that he had to write for, I can't remember which newspaper it was, but some mainstream newspaper, I think the BBC. Uh, and he had one uh, pro-Brexit article and one pro-Remain article and just was going to choose which one he submitted on whichever was the feeling of the day. <laughs> well, well, I mean, he was uh, on the campaign trail uh, and he did resign from the position that was negotiating the Brexit deal once he saw that it was not going anywhere. So I think there's a possibility that um, when he's calling the shots, we will see the true the true dude. And I think we similarly in Australia, when we see Scott Morrison taking the helm, not um, Malcolm Turnbull, as, as uh, was last year, then I think we might see the true colours of the leader. But I don't okay. know. This is, a, this is the type of dirty tactics you get from establishment politicians and media, right? You get, uh, they knew all along that they probably weren't going to deliver uh, a real Brexit and they just hoped the people would kind of let them off the hook eventually. So what happened was after the, I think, 1.3 million vote majority uh, for Brexit, you had, all right, we're going to deliver you Brexit, we just need to negotiate a deal, right? Now that, that party line lasted for quite a while, right? For quite a while, for about two years. Mm. And then what you're starting to see now is, well, I mean, it's gone on for too long, it's too much trouble, we just need to stay in the EU. Oh, well, I mean, the, there's probably a bunch of people who voted to, who, who voted for Brexit that probably aren't even alive anymore and all the young people want to remain. 
So I don't think it's even the popular will anymore. We have to have a second referendum. Mm. Well, the first the first result was um, out of a illegitimate fear campaign from the Brexiteers. We have to have a second re- referendum. So that's what they're saying now. And it's what what you're actually watching is the subversion of the democratic process by the establishment elites, right? And it's like there's obviously a divide between the political class because you're getting it from both the mainstream parties, the Tory party and the and Jeremy Corbyn's Labour party. Mm. Um, and there needs to be some level of holding them to account because even when people put their vote in at the ballot box, it's like it, it, it's just not getting responded to and it's mm. not good enough. Yeah, and for those uh, campaign enthusiasts out there, if you look at how the campaign of the Brexit party was organised, six weeks against all odds, no re- no name recognition, just make it simple, the Brexit party. And, and they really tied that to Nigel Farage, who was known as Mr. Brexit, as, mm. as donned by the Donald. Mm. And, uh, <coughs> and it was simple. That's, that's what they're going to do. They have a manifesto that has all the other policies for a government. But their key thing is nice and simple. And that's what the people want. And isn't it fascinating that they left the UKIP party, who originally were the ones that got them out mm. and, and really spearheaded the original vote in 2016, that they left them in the dirt. Mm. Gerard Batten being the leader there. Mm. Because the yeah. people, they just no want seats. it simple. Yeah. No seats. Yeah. But listen to this slate of hand, right? Listen to this slate of hand some that, the ABC, that the ABC does. That the ABC talks about the language of nationalism, right? This nationalism, the thing that contributed to the 20th century wars, is comprised of faith, community, family, history, culture. Are there any bad things yet? Race and ethnicity comes readily to them. It's like, all right, nobody, no, there's not that many people, right, on the actual alt right, which which Jesus. talks about race all the time, right? Yeah. You get family, community, uh, faith, history, culture. You tick in all the damn boxes, um, and then there's just a tiny fragment which talks about race and ethnicity. Yeah. Um, and like you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and yeah. it's just it's it's just disgraceful. It's actually disgraceful. It's like in the same way. Um, I think it was, it was like the New York Times or someone was, was talking about Peterson and it's like um, while Peterson is uh, not as extreme as figures like Milo Yiannopoulos and Hitler uh, Peterson <laughs> is blah 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 it's like can we just pull, pump, pump the brakes for a second yeah, <laughs> um, what, are you, oh, what are you doing community, faith, family, history, culture then race and ethnicity like, what? do you know who actually talks about race the most? even more than the alt-right? Uh, it's actually the left. It's actually the left. Surprise, surprise. Yet it's intersectionality. They can't get enough of race. The tolerant they say, left. They say, they say skin colour as uh, and sexuality and all these things as the primary defining characteristics of, of a personhood instead of the beliefs, instead of the character, instead of the achievements, instead of the personality of people, right? They get defined by all these things they can't choose before they get defined by all the things they can choose. Like, you, hear, you hear people wax lyrical about identity <laughs> politics, but mm. it's exactly what it is. Yeah. You define someone's identity by things they can't choose. Yeah, in the words is, of Kanye West, <clears throat> break the simulation and try love. Mm, exactly. Got love for my brothers. God bless Kanye West. <laughs> we can never so, go nowhere unless we care for each other. That's Tupac. <laughs> um, yeah. Tupac. We've got to um, start looking at each other as brothers instead of two distant strangers. Mm. The family yeah. unit. My gosh, how it's important. It's so important. Like mm. the people don't realize. The the older I get, the more value I see in the family unit. Like the family unit alone could probably solve the black community um, poverty rate in America. Mm. 